Well, welcome everybody. Sure glad to see you here today and uh, blessings to you all and the Lord. Uh, hopefully you're surviving this hot weather. Um, but uh, we're just looking forward to this new study by Jacob uh, in Philippians. And so let's go ahead and get started. And I'll go ahead and uh, open us in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your love and your care and your grace toward us. Your mercies are new every morning, and we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you are the great physician as well, and that you have healed many of us of different things through the years. We pray for those who are still dealing with various infirmities, that you would be with them and strengthen them. And Lord, we just thank you for your word, and I pray that you would uh, help to help Jacob to uh, be able to bring to mind the things that he has gleaned from from Philippians today. And we just pray, Lord, you be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you so much for joining us here on Moriel TV and on RTN. We're beginning a new Bible study series this evening from the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians. But what we normally do, if we have a Pauline epistle, an epistle written by St. Paul, we try first to put the epistle into a historical perspective or framework. In other words, if we were going to study First Thessalonians, we would read what happened to Paul in Thessalonica in the book of Acts. Or if we were going to read or study First Corinthians, we would read Paul's experience in Corinth in the book of Acts. Or if we were going to study the book of Ephesians, we would look at Paul and Ephesus from the book of Acts. We usually begin looking at a Pauline epistle to a church, not the pastoral ones to individuals, but to churches, um, by going to see what happened historically by way of background. I think, well, I'm quite sure that that gives us a better footing to approach what the epistle is actually saying. It helps us to understand Paul's history and dealing with them and uh, the perspective from which he was writing and relating to the people in churches that he planted and or visited. In any event, let's talk a little bit about Philippians. More about the church itself next week, but it was an important place in Roman history. It is where Brutus, who kill, killed Caesar, or conspired to kill Caesar, and Cassius were defeated by Mark Anthony and by Octavius, who would, of course, become the emperor Caesar Augustus, the first emperor deified in his lifetime in a major type of the Antichrist. It was a major, major trade city, although it was sort of like something that the Greeks still do. It had a port and a city. Um, in Athens today, for instance, Athens is the city, but the port of Athens is Piraeus, Piraeus. So too, the city would have been Philippi, Philippi, but the port would have been Neapolis. Now I've been here and it is one of the best excavated Christian archeological sites in Europe. It is absolutely phenomenally well excavated. So well excavated, you can actually set your foot in the ruins of the prison where Paul was incarcerated. It is also a jointly authored epistle, although Paul is the main signatory and author, he doesn't just write it as from himself, but as, as from his colleagues. Again, more about that a bit next week. But Paul was writing it that way because he was seeing it as the experience of the missionary team who went there with him initially to plant the first church in Europe. This is the first church planted, established in geographical Europe, the first church ever in Europe. Now, of course, in the first century, what is today uh, Western Turkey was the Roman province of Asia. It was culturally European 
it was essentially Greek. Most of it was Greek. Uh, so it was not necessarily the first church in, in a European civilization, but it was the first church it, it, geographically actually in Europe. So it was. The epistle is very important in my estimation because it is the most Christological, the most Christological of the epistles. It deals with and speaks about the person of Christ the most, fully human and fully divine, both fully human and fully divine. Additionally, uh, it, it speaks about Christ in relation to us and us in relation to him as the purpose for our lives, as the one who provides for our lives, what he's called us to do, the centrality of Christ. So in chapter two, and again, as we always say, there's no chapter divisions in the original canon, we see the theological Christology, the divinity and humanity of Christ, and more about that perhaps two weeks, but we also see what that means for us, not only what it meant for the day the epistle was written, but what it has always meant for believers, what it means for us and what it's going to mean. So much for that, more about highlighting these things next week. The city itself, after the, the Roman battle, uh, it was made a Roman colony in 42 BC, 42 BC. It became an important commercial and economic center, an important commercial and economic center. You can still see the ruins of the Roman road connecting it, connecting the Adriatic ports to Southern Italy with the Black Sea, which was the easternmost realm of the Roman Empire, uh, from the Black Sea to the Adriatic. Uh, it was south of the northernmost outpost of the Roman Empire in the north east, that is south of Romania. Romania was, of course, Roman, but it came quite close geographically to the northern border of the Roman Empire in the northeast. Uh, important city in conducting trade across what is today the Balkans, connecting the Black Sea trade with the Adriatic and Roman trade, but also a port accessible directly from the Aegean and from the Mediterranean. What a good place to begin a church. Like all those places, it would have had a Jewish community of some description that was known, but we don't have a mention of synagogues and things like that here. That is quite interesting. That is quite interesting. The Jewish community had not as yet become as well established there as it had in certain other cities. It would not seem at least from anything stated in the text, in the, in the New Testament text. They knew who Jews were, there was something there, but it was not a main feature. Well, Paul would go to the synagogue first, he went down to the river first, but again, let's begin looking at this. Turn with me, please, if you will, to the book of Acts, the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. And we'll begin in verse 11. I'm beginning to get grilled now. The English weather has been, as usual, unpredictable this time of year. Sweltering hot one day, cold rain the next, and shifting from moment to moment. So, let's look. The book of Acts, chapter 16. I'll begin in verse 11, please. Paul went through a tremendous crisis. He writes elsewhere that they even despaired of their lives. This followed a breakup with Barnabas over the issue of John Mark. Now, Paul would later be reconciled to John Mark. We know that. And we know from the historical records of Eusebius that John Mark, together with Barnabas, had quite a mission in establishing Christianity uh, or expanding it in what is today called Cyprus, Cephrisia, in Cyprus. Be that as it may, let's look at what we're saying here. Prior to God beginning a new work geographically in what was then virgin turf, a new region, continental Europe, 
continental Europe, before God doing that, he brought Paul and his team through certain things. We have to understand what this means for us today. He split with Barnabas. There was a split with John Mark. Unfortunately, it was not initially amicable. Later on, we know from Paul's writings, it was reconciled. John Mark worked with Paul later on, but there was a very painful split and an ugly split. We did a teaching on this very subject when godly men disagree, I can refer you to it on the Moriel website. Be that as it may, when God begins a new work, he begins by getting the right team of people who have the right chemistry among them, even in human terms, as well as spiritual, and the right dynamic. The right team is important. The right people with the right gifting Before God begins the work, you can expect a parting of ways with brethren, not necessarily bad brethren, not necessarily people who are gone into heresy or immorality. We should always split over those issues if there's no repentance. I mean, godly men can disagree. Now, this happens and God allows it to happen, or God allows the split to happen for at least two reasons. When you're beginning to do something and you lose key people, God will want to bring in other key people if the work is truly ordained from him. This kind of pruning is not removing the dead wood so there can be new growth. He's not getting rid of the dead wood. That's something else that happens. The Lord gets rid of dead wood to make way for new growth. That is true, but I'm talking about when good, good wood that can bear good fruit is removed by the Lord. Why does this happen? Well, first of all, they're not the people God has for the task he's called you to at that time. Second reason, he has something else for them to do. It should not necessarily be a situation of enmity. Now, the falling out that Paul had, obviously, with Barnabas, God put it in his word to show us, as we've said, that if it can happen to them, it can happen to us. But remember, okay, God removes dead wood. That is true. But sometimes God also removes good wood. He has something else for them to do, and they're not part of the team that you need to do what God is calling you and your colleagues to do. Expect this to happen when the Lord is preparing to do a work. He gets the right team. Not only get rid of the dead wood, but he gets rid of the good wood and calls them elsewhere. He has something else for them to do. That is not necessarily any less important or any less vital than what he's called you to do or me to do. But let's understand this happens. There will be a shakeup in relationships. There will be people leaving ministries and things like this before a new work or a new expansion happens. Secondly, it was preceded by a period of serious trials after Iconium. Paul and his team went through a series of serious trials. A team must be tested in rough times to make sure it can work together. A team must be tested under rough circumstances to be sure it can remain cohesive, that they know the Lord has brought them together to do this thing. And there is a testing period. Now, God already knows who fits and who doesn't. He wants us to know. However, there's more to it than that the trials that he allows before the new work are a live fire exercise, as the military would call it. It is a live fire exercise. He is hardening his troops for combat. 
So if God is ever calling to somebody to plant a new church or to pioneer into a new mission field, expect these things to happen. There will be not necessarily conflict, but it may come to that to get the right team together. Secondly, expect a time of testing, both to prove it's the right team and to teach the team to work together during difficult times. These are simply the realities. Forget the binding and loosing and we take authority. We don't want this division. You know, people say that stuff and it's not reality. There is a unity of the spirit, of course, and, and, and there is a binding of, of, of spirits in certain contexts, but it's not that. It's not that. When you see people talking that way, it's a combination of doctrinal ignorance, um, a lack of spiritual growth, and uh, basically, again, emotionally charged religiosity. It's not reality. You train soldiers for combat, not by an easy situation or with a pep rally. First, you bring them through simulated combat situations, and then you have a pep rally. So it was with Paul. The pep rally comes when he has the vision to go to Macedonia. Notice the mission field or the work was there. When God calls someone to plant the church or to venture into a new mission field, it is already foreordained by the Lord where he has you to go and what he has you to do. Let's continue looking at this. Therefore, putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis. Now, I've been to Neapolis. It's quite close, quite close to the ruins of Philippi. Nice place, nice view of the straits. Okay. Near where Asia and Europe come together. Okay. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in this city for some days. Philippi was named after Philip of Macedonia, the military conqueror, who was the first one to organize armies regimentally. He was, of course, the father of Alexander the Great. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. And a certain woman named Lydia from the city of Theatida, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken of by God. Whenever the Lord calls a missionary to a new mission field, whenever the Lord calls people to establish a new church where there is none, whenever that happens, there are people there waiting. There are people there waiting for it to happen. I'm often reminded of the story of the last time there was an authentic revival, a real revival in Great Britain. It was in the Hebrides Islands in the aftermath of the Second World War in Scotland. And the evangelist Duncan Campbell came, but when he came, there were people waiting for him. And he was asked, brother, are you walking with God? There were women who met in a cottage and prayed for years that a revival that a spiritual awakening would happen in this island inhabited by fishermen and their families. A rough, cold place, rough place, okay? And they prayed and prayed and prayed. These women just prayed and trusted and believed God that at the right time, he'd send the right person. Well, one of those women who prayed was the great aunt of Donald Trump, was the great aunt of Donald Trump. Uh, he had evangelical Christians, saved Christians in his family. 
Be that as it may, Duncan Campbell came. There were people waiting. And that's so often the case. Missionaries have gone to tribal areas and people were spiritually hungry. There were people who were spiritually hungry. They might not have understood the gospel. They might not have per se heard it. But there was a spiritual hunger, an awareness of God, an awareness of sin, an awareness of a need for salvation. Even total pagans have had that. People are made in God's image and likeness. And there's cases where missionaries went to places and the tribal peoples were open. They didn't know anything. They had to forsake and reject their pagan beliefs. But when they heard the true beliefs, they knew that's what they were looking for, or hoping for. You read some of the testimonies of some of these missionaries, like William Burton, the founder of uh, Congo Evangelical Mission. He went to a place where they'd never seen a white person. Or Dr. David Livingston, the first medical missionary. He went to a place where they'd never seen a white person. Yet there were tribal people there disillusioned by their paganism, aware of their sin and waiting for a move of God or waiting for something. They didn't know what it was, but when the missionary arrived, it began to happen and happened conspicuously and gained momentum. When God calls you to work, to plant a new church, there's people there. So many churches have begun as house groups people meeting in a home because they couldn't find the church that was any good scripturally, or there was no church. And it happens. So the Sabbath day, this be the Jewish Sabbath, they went outside the gate to a riverside. And that's where they meet Lydia, a successful businesswoman, a seller of purple fabrics. These are dyed fabrics. Fabrics were made with dyes very often made from Crust, uh, crushed crustaceans. They'd get a juice from crust, crushed crustaceans, crushed crustaceans, and use it to dye fabric. That is how the temple veil of the temple in Jerusalem was made. And when she and her household had been baptized after the Lord spoke to her, she was a worshiper of God. This would have meant that she was at least some kind of a God fearer. There already were people there who knew about the true God. These were Gentile God-fearers listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, written here testimonially, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay, and she prevailed upon us. She had to talk them into it. So God has people waiting. God has people waiting. When a new work is commissioned by God, there's people waiting for it to happen. Remember, Paul had a vision when he was still in Asia of somebody calling him to come. Verse 16, and it happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, now, I've been there by the river in Philippi. It is a very nice place to visit, a very nice place to visit. It's somber, it's serene, um, and you can really sense the atmosphere to this day because the archaeological ruins are so well preserved in Philippi. A certain slave girl having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out saying, these men are bond servants of the most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. And she continued doing this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and it came out of her at that very moment. But when her masters saw their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, 
dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and for proclaiming customs, which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe being Romans. Let's understand this. When God ordains or commissions a new work, it is going to be attacked. Those attacks characteristically come in two ways. Direct demonic attack, this case, but then some kind of social and or civil attack. And you see this happening where they enforce zoning ordinances against Christians specifically and so forth. More of that in a moment. So you have this woman who is demon possessed. She has what the Greek calls a Pythian spirit. In the Greek text, it is a Pythian spirit from Python, Python. Now understand what this means. The serpent beguiled the woman. We know what Paul writes to the, to the Corinthians. Lest you be deceived by the way the serpent deceived Eve. Or Revelation, the dragon and the serpent are cast down to you. Satan as the seducer, as the deceiver. She was working by spiritual seduction. Notice it brings in money. People who are into the occult are into money. They see it as a way to make money. Now here we have to be very careful. The first thing we see, the first caveat was this. Paul did not go around looking for demons to cast out. They came to him. He knew who she was and what she was. Even then, he did not attempt to perform an exorcism and cast the demon out of him until she vexed him, annoyed him to the point of interfering with the ministry, the preaching of the gospel. Do not look for direct encounters with the demonic. Do not look for it. Don't worry. They'll find you. They'll find you. You don't have to go on a hunt. They will find you. It is also not an area of ministry that Paul saw as his priority. His priority was the preaching of the gospel. That's not to say there is not a place for casting out demons. There is, if it's authentic demonic possession. However, in this case, she just kept annoying him, interfering with the team, interfering with their evangelism, this python spirit of seduction. So Paul deals with it. Notice it's made clear she's a pagan. She's obviously not a believer. And there's a financial element to it. This is the confrontation. Okay. I've said many times, the epistles interpret other scripture and speak of many things. They speak of many issues and subjects explaining the Gospels, explaining the teachings of Jesus and of the Hebrew prophets and how those things are fulfilled in Christ. Many things. But the single biggest theme, the thing that the epistles, that the apostles were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the most about is our conduit our walk, our role in ministry, life, in this present fallen world until the Lord returns. There are other things, important things, but 
the thing that the epistles speak about the most, the single most recurrent thing found in the epistles is how believers are to live and serve the Lord in this fallen world. In other words, dealing with the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. In all of the instructions the apostles give in dealing with the world, the flesh, and the devil, never, not even one time, do you see them casting a demon out of a believer? You don't see it. They may have had a demon before they were a believer, Simon Magnus and things like this. Oh, nobody says otherwise. No one suggests unsaved people cannot be demon-possessed. Now, again, we make a distinction between demonic possession where the word is ekbalo, to cast out, and demonic oppression, where the word is therapeo. Believers can be oppressed. They can be deceived and even bewitched, we're told in Galatians. But full-blown demonic possession, that can only happen to an unsaved person or to a categorical un unrepentant backslider but no place the demons ever cast out of believers. Now, the financial element. I have warned many times that what you see with the word faith money preachers, their prophecies are more clairvoyance. Their miracles are bogus. Why are they doing these things? The occult always counterfeits the gifts of the spirit. That is the charismatic gifts. Magic counterfeits the gift of miracles. The gibberish tongues you see with witch doctors and shamanists counterfeit the gift of tongues. The I have a picture, I have a word stuff, it's clairvoyance, it counterfeits scriptural words of knowledge and the gift of prophecy. The occult always counterfeits. But in the church, you will see an abundance of counterfeits. The Python spirit has gotten in. One of the ways to know that a Python, not the only, but one of the ways to know the Python spirit has gotten in is you see the ones who engage in this are in it for money. It's what they talk about the most. Again, as we've said many times, the New Testament says very little about money, and what it does is generally a warning about the love of it. Some of the word faith money preachers can be calculated up to 70% of what they say rotates on the subject of getting money. They're doing the same thing as the masters of this slave girl with the python spirit, the fortune teller. Now, obviously, she had demonic powers. There is a certain amount of demonic power in the occult. Pharaoh's magicians counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron. There is a counterfeit demonic power. It is never as powerful as the Holy Spirit, but you see, it exists. We see this, of course, in the story of Simon Magnus. He knew the apostles had a power beyond anything he had when he was in the occult because of the Holy Spirit. Be that as it may, where the Python spirit is, you will find a counterfeit of the charismatic gifts and a financial motive. Now, in a clear situation where you're dealing with pagans and non-belief, this is not so much an issue. But when the Python spirit gets into the church, it becomes an issue. I can handle it when it's the pagans. I remember one time our mission in Moriel, South Africa, and I was in 
taken into a Zulu village to do an evangelistic meeting. And there was a Morio missionary with me who spoke Zulu, and there was a Zulu pastor, and they came in. And the place was filled up amazingly. You know, the, the, the tribal people wanted to come hear what the white Mabwana was going to tell them. And I preached on the story of Simon Magnus. And I identified him as a Sangorma. A Sangorma is what black South Africans generally from various tribes call a witch doctor, a witch doctor. And this stuff is of course demonic. Uh, they believe he has supernatural powers and so forth. And the Sangormas are out for money. And I spoke about Simon Magnus and I said, look, the power of the Sangorma is never as powerful as the power of the Lord. It's always a counterfeit. And look, he wanted to buy the Holy Spirit. Sangormas only think in terms of money. Everything to them is money. They want to get money from you. And I, I and the, they were all listening. They were listening really attentively to what I was saying about the Sangormas presenting Simon Magnus as being a Sangorma. Now this is again a tribal people in a very primordial rural situation. And I found that at the end of the meeting that there were two Sangormas who came to hear what the white Mambwana was telling their clientele. <laughs> this is a big issue in societies that still have shamanism. And there's a lot of shamanism, it, be it the voodoo in Haiti, be it the Sangormas in Southern Africa. You see this in uh, uh, mystical Buddhism, in uh, Ther Theravada B B Buddhism, all kinds of things. Certainly in Taoism and animism in Indonesia, you encounter these things, but it's there. There will be a spiritual attack when the Lord begins a new work. It will come in the form of the demonic. And it will come in the form of a python, attempted spiritual seduction. Now notice this woman was saying true things, was saying true things about Paul and his colleagues. She was saying true things, but it was still demonically motivated. One of the things Christians misunderstand is that, as we always say, paras luxusin, Satan puts lies next to error. False teachers and false prophets put lies next to error, as it says in 2 Peter chapter 2. They will always use truth to disguise lies. Uh, again, when they, when they knock on the door, you and I would agree with 50% of what the Jehovah's Witnesses say. We would probably agree with 70% of what the Roman Catholic Church says. We might agree with 60% of what the rabbis say. There's always truth in it. Just enough truth. So the python can bite. Those groomed in the truth, of course, will be able to pick up these serpents and not be bitten. That's what Jesus meant. His real disciples will be made immune or invulnerable to spiritual seduction. But other people, young believers and undiscerning believers, the serpent will bite them. So expect a demonic attack when there is a new movement and expect the vehicle of the demonic attack, the person or persons to say a lot of true and correct things. That may have been a factor why Paul did not rebuke or deal with her initially. She was saying true things, even though he understood what Satan was doing. Then 
it expands. Then it becomes social and civil. Now notice this. They recognize them as Jews. At this point, Christianity was still very much seen as Messianic Judaism, a Messianic sect within Judaism, Jews who believed Jesus was the Messiah. That was its common perception. But notice something also that we see elsewhere in Acts. These men are Jews, anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism. It'll be there. When there's a move or the work of God, Satan will try to get anti-Semitism into the church. Satan knows that the prophetic and salvific purposes of God ultimately depend on both his plan for the true church and his plan for the salvation of Israel and the Jews. The kingdom of Christ cannot come until the purposes of God for the church are fulfilled and until the purposes of God for Israel and the Jews are fulfilled. The Protestant Reformation seemed like a great breakthrough. Initially, Luther, a 95 thesis, he was on the money. His debate with John Eck, fantastic. He inspires William Tyndale. Everything's going good. But then his polemics against the Jews when they would not respond to what he was saying. Initially, he was not replaced in theology. He made it clear. And he warned against anti-Semitism. And he said that the Jews, that the natural relatives of Jesus and things like this, he made it clear God had a purpose for them. The anti-Semitic spirit got in. So much so that he said, we, we the German people, must slay them to prove we are Christians. And get into the whole thing of burning the books and the synagogues and all this. Nine of the 14 Lutheran bishops after the Kristallnacht in Germany, Hitler's rise to power when the Holocaust began, nine of the 14 supported Hitler. In his book, Mein Kampf, Hitler quoted Luther repeatedly to try to make it seem like a Christian cause, a Protestant cause. <clears throat> when you see replacement theology, you're seeing something a lot more than replacement theology. You're seeing the corruption of the church. It is always a symptom that there's something wrong spiritually. He's a man who I never had a high regard for theologically. I agreed that Martin Lloyd-Jones spoke the truth about him. Martin Lloyd-Jones didn't like John Stott either. I certainly never did. He was an Anglican. He was into infant baptism and a lot of other things. But he was into vehement, vehement anti-Zionism. He teamed up with Stephen Sizer to write a book against Israel. Then he began teaching annihilationism and a lot of other things. I didn't have any respect for John Stott. I never, even before that, I didn't think much of him, but then I just wrote him off completely. No, whenever there's a move or a work of God, Satan will try to drive a wedge between God's purpose for Israel and God's purpose for the church. Faithful Christians will always remember Romans 9 through 11, the natural branches. They'll always know that. They will always have a view of that and not be replacement. When you see replacement theology, it is a symptom of something else going wrong. It is, in fact, generally the anti-Semitism of the secular world 
conjured up by Satan getting into the church. These men are Jews. Oh, it's the Jews making trouble. It was the same thing with Claudius. Watch out for this. Watch out for it. Then it continues. They're throwing the city into confusion. Well, in fact, they were losing money. <laughs> Their cash cow stopped mooing. And they're proclaiming customs which is not lawful for us to accept or to observe being Romans. Notice customs and law. Kulturkampf and the misuse of law. This is something we spoke about on Word for the Weekend two weeks ago. A cultural war. A woman evangelist, Hatun Tash, was stabbed in the face the week before last at Speaker's Corner in London, where I used to preach before I was succeeded by the very eminent and much more qualified Jay Smith, who is a better evangelist to the Muslims than I am. My thing was more with Jews and Catholics. I was attacked by 40 Muslims one time, but she was stabbed in the face and she got up covered with blood and kept preaching Jesus. What a saint to God. You can't help but love her. What a sister. Uh, there's a spiritual conflict, but there's a cultural conflict. The Islamization of Western society. It's coming to the United States now, being allowed and encouraged by one American administration after another. Mr. Trump tried to stop it. The Bush was all for it. Obama was for it. Now Biden is for it. They're not vetting these people coming in with radical backgrounds. It's San Bernardino bombing happened because of it. Well, whenever you have Islam growing in a society, you're going to have a cultural conflict. And that cultural conflict will be with Christianity and Jews. You hear their battle cry. First the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. First, we'll get rid of the Jews, then we'll get rid of the Christians. This is inherent in it. Now, I'm not saying there are not moderate Muslims who don't agree with this, but I am saying there's a cultural war between the Judeo-Christian West, the backslidden Judeo-Christian West, and an increasingly radicalized Islam in the Western world. It is abundant in Britain and Europe, and it is and obviously in the United States. A preacher was arrested in Britain last week, a street evangelist, because he was critical of homosexuality. He was simply stating what the Bible said about it. They demanded he be arrested. They had no charges, so they held him for about 10 hours and then let him go in the middle of the night. Uh, this is happening more and more. It's happening in Canada. It's happening in Britain. They're just arresting street preachers. Depriving people of freedom of speech. And even calling what's in the scripture hate speech. Radical homosexuals, Muslims. They're trying to push a law in New Zealand now. That if you are critical that if you express an opinion that does not condone or in any way challenges the beliefs of Islam or the issue is homosexuality natural or not, they want to call it hate speech and arrest you. This is in New Zealand. The legislation is pending, supported by the present New Zealand government. They have a terrible prime minister. May God remove her. This is what happened in the first church in Europe. 
and it's what's happening now. A cultural war, people with financial interests, and it becomes a situation where Christians are accused unjustly of promoting social unrest. Then they can't become accused of breaking laws and being criminals. You will not find in Britain radical Muslims being arrested very often, and they preach some vicious things. And <laughs> you've had Muslims knifing people in the streets and murdering British soldiers in the streets. Or Police are very reluctant to arrest them unless they kill somebody. Then they have to go, go through and do it. But radical homosexuals, the police, <laughs> it's the Christians who get arrested. The Christians are accused of proclaiming customs which are not lawful for us as Romans to accept. <laughs> it is... <laughs> They call it breaking the law. They call the COVID comp criminal. If you don't agree with us, you're a criminal. And they demand criminal action against you. The crowd rose up together in verse 22, came together against them and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. And when they inf inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. So the first attack is purely spiritual. The second attack becomes social and cultural. Then it becomes legal. Don't look for justice. Well, there'll be justice when Christ returns. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison. That is H block. That is maximum security. And fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, I'm not going into it now. You cannot base a doctrine on type or typology. But notice when you see midnight and earthquake and words like that occurring in a context, there are other passages using those terms that speak of the Lord's return. They hint or foreshadow it in some way. Again, I'm only stating this in passing. I'm not using it to teach a doctrine. I'm simply pointing it out as a feature of the text. There are other texts in scripture that speak of the return of Christ that have the same idea. It's coming in the middle of the night and, and the earthquake and things when the graves open and so forth. When there's a, a, a release. And the prisoners were listening to them. How can these guys be so celebratory when they're locked up in maximum security with their feet in stocks? And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison house was shaken. Notice the earthquake was not at midnight, but shortly after. I pointed out for a reason. The rapture does not occur at the halfway point but it occurs relatively shortly after. And immediately all the doors were open, everyone's chains were unfastened. Something highlighted or borrowed by Charles Wesley uh, for his famous hymn, My Chains Fell Off, My Heart Was Free, I Rose One Forth and Followed Thee, and Can It Be That I Should Gain. And when the jailer had been roused, out of sleep and had seen the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. Under Roman law, the jailer would be capitally sentenced. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, 
Do yourself no harm. We are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in. Now notice this guy was a boss. When it says jailer, it's more like a warden. He had subordinates. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This can and does happen. Our persecutors, seeing our faith, become convicted of their sin and turn to Christ. It doesn't happen every day. It doesn't happen every time, but it does happen. And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, and you shall be saved, you and your household. Now, again, that is one of those verses where Peter Baptist, infant baptism practitioners distort out of context and say that they went home and had the kids baptized and all this stuff. They read more into the text than it actually says. They assume that the other people in the family were not saved. In fact, when somebody becomes a believer, the first ones they usually tell are their families. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, together with all who were in the house, told the whole family. That's why the household was baptized. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and his household. There is never a scriptural reason to delay baptism upon a profession of faith. And he brought them into his house, and he set food before them. The Greek is like a table. Okay. And rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. The whole family was saved. Now, when they came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen saying, release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the chief magistrates have sent to release you. Now, therefore, come and go in peace. As Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. When Satan persecutes the church, inevitably, one way or another, sooner or later, it will backfire on him. May not happen all at once, may not happen in a way we expect, but it happens. Release those men. We just want them detained and we wanted to beat them so they'll stop doing it. They're not real criminals. These judges in Canada and these places, they know these Christians are not real criminals. They just want to make a show of them. They want to placate their enemies. They want to do the will of their political bosses. They want to stop them from doing what they do but they know they're not real criminals. They're trying to put that Polish-Canadian pastor back in jail again for some stupid reason, as if he were a criminal. Well, what's Paul's reaction? The jailer reported these words to Paul. The chief magistrates have sent to release you. Now, therefore, come and go in peace. <laughs> what does Paul say? But Paul said to them, they've beaten us in public without trial. They acted illegally. The police acted illegally. Their political bosses acted illegally. We are men who are Romans. Uh-oh. He's got a Roman passport. We treated a Roman citizen like this. We're a Roman colony. 
He has the right to appeal to Caesar. What did we get ourselves into? We tried to sweep it under the rug and make it go away, but he's not having it. They've thrown us into prison and are sending us away secretly. Paul says, no, indeed. Let them come themselves and bring us out. Now he has the local political apparatus on the hook. And he doesn't let them off. Neither should we. When you get these politicians who placate the left and persecute Christians on the hook, when you get these prosecutors, when you have these bureaucrats who are using the police improperly, when you get these people on the hook, we don't let them off. Oh, we're Christians. We have to be gracious. We have to forgive. And no. If they get away with it the first time, they'll do it the next time to other Christians. Being gracious does not mean being stupid. They broke the law. They have to be held accountable. We appeal to Caesar. We exercise our legal rights. That's what the apostles did. Be careful of this moronic mentality that many Christians have. Oh, we have to forgive. Jesus said we'd be persecuted. Now, those things are true, but the way they're applying it is not true. Oh, we have to comply with the laws. What about when the laws are not legal themselves? Verse 38, the policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates. And they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Oh, no. Now, notice the police were only the instruments. The real problem with the magistrates. And they came and appealed to them. Oh, please, we're sorry we had you arrested and beaten. It was all a mistake. It was all a misunderstanding. Yeah, but you did it. You're supposed to enforce the law and you broke it and you were going to be held legally accountable. There must be justice. If you let them violate your rights, they'll violate the rights of other Christians. Understand what Satan is wanting to do. Oh, we struggle not against flesh and blood. <laughs> it's not about the people. It's about the spirit. I'm back of these things. There's a demonic spirit in the White House right now. There's a demonic spirit in Congress. There's a demonic spirit in the courts. We're not being governed by men who are believers or governed by God or even hold to biblical principles anymore. When Paul had them on the hook, he wouldn't let them go. And they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. It continues. It would be some 10 years later, approximately, when Paul would write the epistle to the Philippians, also from prison, how appropriate. Scholars, historians debate whether it was from Rome or whether it was from Caesarea Maritina. 
where Paul was in prison two years. They're not sure there's a there's a debate, historical debate, where he wrote it from. More a bit about a bit more about that next week. But this was the place he was imprisoned. And this was the place he wrote to from a prison. The first church in Europe. What are we saying? When we look at the epistle next week, beginning in chapter one, we have to understand the nature of the relationship Paul had with this church when he sent Epaphrodites with the letter to be read in that church. And we have to understand how things in that church had changed and grown. Ten years later, he saw the growth. Ten years later, he could look back and say, it was worth going to jail for. It was worth being beaten for. It was worth being humiliated publicly for. It was worth having my rights as a citizen violated for. Satan lost. The python didn't succeed. Neither did the dragon, the serpent and the dragon, the deceiver and the persecutor, just as we read in Revelation. The serpent was defeated. So was the dragon. Was it an easy battle? No, it was a costly one. But there was a victory in Christ. There's always a victory in Christ. Maybe it's easy for us to say, but it might not always be easy for us to say. You'll be hated by all nations on account of my name. So, when we see ourselves in a situation where God is calling us to begin or pioneer a new work, no, we need the right team. He'll get rid of the dead wood, but he'll even get rid of some of the good wood because he has something else for them to do instead. We need the right dynamic, the right chemistry, the right cohesion with the right people for what we're being called to do. When God removes the others, it does not necessarily mean there's something wrong with them or they're bad. That may be the case, but it may not be. Understand Satan is going to attack. First, it'll come by the serpent. Then it will come by the dragon. First by spiritual seduction, then by violent opposition. Notice there'll be a cultural conflict. Notice that the nations are naturally anti-Semitic. Non-believers are naturally anti, have a predisposition towards anti-Semitism. People who come in contact with Jews will tend to hate them in every nation. That's been their history. This goes back to Genesis 3. They hate the Jews for the same reason they hate believers. They're the descendants of Abraham. Separate subject. We've talked about it many times. All these Jews are making trouble again. Then it goes on. Cultural conflict. Resorting in social and political upheaval. In this he rejoices. In this he even sees some of his persecutors come to faith. His jailers. And their families. In this, he gets the powers that be on the hook. He knows how to use his legal rights. 
Remember in Romans, God has ordained legal authority for his purpose. Satan uses it. We let the homosexuals and the Muslims use it. And somehow foolishly think it is carnal or unspiritual for believers to use it. That is absolute nonsense. It is not scriptural. It is not God's wisdom. It is spiritual seduction in itself to think that way. And so it happens. What happened to Paul? In Philippi both before he arrived, when he arrived, and after he arrived, is a pattern. Those same spiritual forces that were against him will be against us. Always the same. The era in history, the Zitzemleben, it can cause variation in how it comes about. But it doesn't change the fact it will come about. And you just think, 10 years later, he's in jail again. He's in prison again. Either in the Maritime prison in Rome or the prison in a Kesaria Maritina in Israel, in the Praetorium, another fantastic place to visit if you ever have the opportunity, if you haven't been there. Uh, well, when he's in prison, he looks back and he says, she, I remember the first time I was in prison here in Europe. Uh, I remember the first time I was in prison. Look at all the good that came from it. Here I am again, I'm in jail, but Christ is gonna be glorified. Souls will be saved. The enemy will be defeated and there will be new growth. Well, that's quite a thing. That was what happened when Paul first came to Philippi. And this frames in large part the content of the things he emphasizes when he writes the epistle. We'll continue there, Lord willing, next week, Thursday, same time, same place. Thank you so much for joining us. Greetings and blessings in Jesus to everyone.